right. Hi, everyone. Welcome. So happy to have you here. Welcome, welcome. Hi, Chow. Wow. All right, well, I'll just take a moment, I guess, get, let everybody get into the room, get settled just for a minute or two. I'll get my slides up. I'm really excited and um, honored to be with you here today. So. This works. Do, do, do. All right. How's that looking? Can you see my slides up there? Perfect. Thank you. I can see some of you, but uh, not all. And I've lost the uh, the chat box while um, <laughs> while putting up my slides. So uh, I'll I'll loop back with that after after my presentation is done. Oh, let me start off for the beginning. That always helps too. Well, as I said, I'm really pleased and honored to be with you today. What an inspirational, buzzy session that we've been all a part of. It's like my mind is blowing. <laughs> so um, I must confess, I uh, couldn't help but do a little bit of work on this presentation last night trying to weave in some of these beautiful and stunning concepts. So I feel like I need to, I, I think probably many of us are feeling like we almost need to take our practice into like overdrive um, because we've been in a time warp for the past few months, haven't we? Uh, what day is it? <laughs> Anyways, um, so thank you. As I said, I'm really pleased and honored to be here today. I'll say who I am. I'm Jade Yuhia. I'm I work with Island Health, so um, here on Vancouver Island. And I mean, I guess before I even start on who I am, um, speaking of place, because we're going to be talking about place in this session quite uh, immensely so, um, I really want to acknowledge and respect uh, the Lingwangwen and Songhese Esquimalt Wunsenak peoples whose historical relationships with the land continue to this day. And I have the um, honor, privilege, um, and pleasure to live, work, and play on these beautiful lands. So, so thank you so much. And um, as I was also going to say, I'm Jade Yehia, uh, work with Island Health. I'm the Healthy Built Environment Consultant uh, with the organization. So um, have kind of a, a, a unique role with the department. I won't go on and on, um, but my background is I'm an environmental health officer and um, have a background in health geography, um, health impact assessment, and um, I have, uh, yeah, I, I, I feel so lucky that I have a really kind of cool and exciting role with the Health Authority where I work to promote and support the consideration and inclusion of health in land use planning. So I'll get to that. So, you know, what the topic for today, what is a sustainable, just and healthy, healthy local housing system? So, you know, reflecting on this, and I'm sure these concepts, uh, many for many of you, you probably are going to know them well. I think probably intuitively in our minds and also in our hearts. Um, but really, what is this opportunity um, that we have to link health um, to the built environment, this opportunity that, that we have right now? We know the built environment has such a significant impact on our health. And sorry, the built environment being all of those human-made um, surroundings that we've created, as um, Trevor really started us off, uh, you know, we have fully modified our landscapes. And we know that those landscapes have such an impact on our health. Thinking and reflecting around how community design and what's in close proximity to you, so in your local landscape, um, the traffic safety and injury prevention. Do you have options and opportunities to have safe um, infrastructure to get from point A to point B where you can use your feet and, and, and burn fat rather than fuel um, to get from point A to point B? What is your walkability like? Do you have access to public transit? For many of us, it's not within our, our backyard um, to have that amenity and access. 
what about the mental health effects with the built environment? This is an arena all unto itself. I think, you know, in this space that we've all been in, this crazy world that we've been living in the last few months um, with the COVID pandemic, we've all found those that, that mental health reprieve and benefits for engaging with nature, I think pre-COVID, but isn't it like even put it even more under the magnifying glass? Um, and there's a lot of research um, indicating and clearly emphasizing those mental health benefits with engaging with our natural environment. And for years and years, the mental health effects um, related to the built environment um, attributed to noise pollution. So do you have a busy roadway next to you? Do you live next to an industrial site that's uh, really uh, noisy, that has a significant impact on our mental health well-being, sleep disturbance, stress, immense linkages there? What about air and water quality? Um, these are pieces foundational to me as an environmental health officer, but do you have clean air to breathe? Um, what, is, um, what is your local municipalities and, and governments and um, provincial entities doing around curbing and curtailing air pollution in our regions and where we live? Um, what about safe and potable water to drink? We know for many of us out there, um, that's just not uh, a basic asset or amenity that we have. Um, what about access to healthy foods? Do you have a healthy grocery store in close proximity to you? Is it affordable? What about farmer's market, local food sourcing? Uh, I know there's a whole concurrent session going on right now about this exact topic. And again, it's an immense topic unto itself. What about social inclusion in the built environment or um, flip side of that coin, exclusion? Um, what about health, and equi health equity and inequities in our built environment? Um, for those that maybe are less able, um, you know, need a wheelchair or walker, or just for example, to get from point A to point B, do they have safe infrastructure at all to do so? And what about access to affordable and safe housing? Something that we are seeing so evidently, again, under this magnifying glass right now during the COVID pandemic. So I'm going to pop up just a couple of slides about some of um, our chronic disease findings related to the built environment. This is work that came out last year out of UBC, uh, Dr. Lawrence Frank and his team, that we know um, from a walkability standpoint that people living in a walkable area are 42% less likely to be obese compared to those living in a car-dependent neighborhood. For example for park access as it relates to heart disease and there's some amazing stats and facts on this slide i'm just pulling out a couple people living in an area with many parks are 39 percent less likely to have heart disease compared to those living in an area with no parks at all so where truly does matter is it just about behavior change as trevor said this morning it's, uh, it's about healthy choices being those easy choices in our backyard, about designing in healthy living into our built environment. You know, we know through public health, health promotion approaches, um, incredibly important that have focused on education, but just focusing and emphasizing around individual behavior change have had limited success. It's, it's about embedding in some of those principles so we have those assets in our, in our backyards in a perfect world. Talking about some of the data, and again, in, in line with what we've been talking about in this conference, from a global perspective and bringing it down to today's um, theme, local, I thought I'd pull out some of those um, national stats and facts that chronic diseases are overwhelming um, our healthcare budgets. They consume 67% of healthcare budget in Canada and cost Canadians $190 billion per year, about $65 billion in treatment and $135 billion in lost productivity. And rates are increasing faster than the GDP in some provinces. Healthcare costs threaten to overwhelm provincial budgets across the country. And I must confess, this is a couple of years ago. This is actually taken from the Canadians Association of Physicians for the Environment, CAPE. Um, they have some phenomenal resources Anna, that I'm- um, I'm a, a patient at uh, your <gasps> clinic. Um, oh, yeah. I haven't had my appointment in a while. And this morning I woke up and my right eye is really blurry. Like I have double vision in my right eye. Okay. Um, Amlani. Oh, I think- um, E-M-L-A. N I Lanny, just so you know, you're um unmuted. Ashraf, A S H R A F. 
Mm -hmm. hear you. Can you. You are all hearing Lanny as well? Yes, okay. Um, Lanny, Jade, you you? If, yeah. you, if, if you have host privileges for the breakout room, yeah. you can actually turn her off. Or mute oh, her. okay, okay, thank you, thank you. Oh yes, I know I don't wanna hear her personal information there. Lanny, we hope you're okay. Okay, sorry. Just to see if I minimize this, thank you. Thank she, you for that. She is muted now. Oh, is she? Oh, thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate that. Okay. Okay. I'm going to continue on if I may. I, and I'm almost done. I really want to hear from you guys. So, um, you know, I, I, I thought, as I said, I, I flashed this up. It's, it's speaking about um obviously her economy but uh i think very timely uh in this week um you know we've been hearing in the news what's going on as some of these healthcare costs i really wonder what they're going to look like uh post covid um you know we've uh i think it was announced on wednesday wasn't it that uh we're at uh, the challenge of our lifetimes federal deficit hit 343 billion this year it was uh um from CTV, and it's interesting. I, I, I modified this last night, so bear with me, I'm sorry, but um, it, I was taking a couple of excerpts from uh, Bill Nor Morneau, our finance minister, um, that the COVID pandemic has had a major impact on the social and economic well-being of Canadians in every part of our country. Today and the months to come, our economic health will de largely depend on our public health. Wow, such an opportunity that we are in, in a crazy uh, way. So anyways, sorry. Um, as I said, Lanny, we hope you're okay. And I'm gonna carry on. Um, I just wanted to flash up a couple other slides, you know, kind of taking this global, um, national, and, and taking it a little bit closer to my home in the province of BC, um, there's some really phenomenal resources out of the Ministry of Environment and Climate Change looking at the impacts of climate change clearly and concretely on health. We've been talking about this through this entire conference, so I'm not going to belabor some of these linkages, but some really great infographics that can be populated that you could take and potentially embed into your practice. And isn't this this opportunity to kind of break some of these silos down, harnessing the, the, the data, the evidence from environment entities, um, health, and partnering up with local government to sing these important stories and songs. Because a lot of what I'm talking about is within that domain of local government, as Fred, Mayor Hines, um, spoke about this morning with the One Senate region. So another kind of tool that I use in my tool belt is, is tapping into our local health data, our population demographics, our determinants of health, our health status and indicators. In my conversations that I do on a day to day, knocking on local government store and speaking with land use planners to sing and be that health cheerleader in the sidelines, I'm using this data to really help to use um, to employ and bring evidence-based, uh, uh, you know, practice and, and population health data um, to those discussions. We know our population is aging. We know a lot of people do not have those amenities and assets that I was talking to um, about before. You know, a lot of our, our affordable housing is more at the at the periphery of our, our towns and the communities and speaking in an urban setting sense that we don't have the option to, um, to take public transit, to use active transportation. It, it, the, the, we're seeing that insurgence growing, but um, still uh, there's a lot more we can be doing. So I hope the concept that I'm trying to convey is this um, concept of multi-solving, a, a, a concept that was presented to me by some lovely colleagues at a phenomenal consulting firm here in BC. Um, uh, that you know, it's 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 tying in those those co-benefits, changing lives for the better, and protecting the climate helping our city to invest, for example, in cycling infrastructure to improve public health and emissions and cut those emissions, excuse me. It's finding solutions rooted in equity that reduce fossil fuel use and produce co-benefits in health, resilience, and well-being. Again, from the, the work out of UBC there, where really truly does matter and collaboration is key, making those connections and ties in the built environment, how they relate to a beho behavior exposure um, aspect within our personal and individual health, that biological response um, that results in over time chronic diseases that is consuming the bulk of our healthcare costs and utilizations. 
I think Cora flashed up. I wanted to steal that slide. I hope she, <laughs> she's going to be sharing it. Sounds like she is. But really what that question that she so brilliantly spoke to in her last slide, what is our bounce forward? Um, you know, bringing that, I think we're, we're connecting these dots, these immense complex sticky dots together, bringing a health climate change, COVID-19 lens, and if I may interject, to land use planning. We're seeing those opportunities right now closing down streets to support physical distancing and promote active transportation. We're finding new ways like this in this conference to socially connect. I mean, what an amazing session bringing all of us together and we're not having a drive to get or take a plane to get to a, a conference to all meet. Um, seeing that all of a sudden this in, insurgence of, of, of housing for all um, housing of the homeless and, and yes it is not perfect and there's still a lot a lot of work that needs to be done in this arena but rabbit interventions because um, if you don't have a home how can you shelter in place we're seeing air quality improvements I'm not and excuse me here I'm not at the, as familiar with what's going on in the other provinces but in British Columbia um, over the last few months uh, the Ministry of Environment actually put a ban a complete ban on open burning um, knowing that uh, any exasperation to our respiratory health makes it at an increased vulnerability uh, for developing complications related to COVID so we're seeing that um, massive movement on um, on by law implementation or modification in response of where we're at through the pandemic. So what are our opportunities? And I invite you to, to speak to this in this space as the many opportunities um, for climate change action um, is the little infographic says it's putting people's health and well-being first, no exceptions. And I think I uh, was at Dr. Uh, Thomas Homer Dixon flashed this up yesterday. So thank you for letting me um, chat to you all. I'm gonna change my hat and, and put on a facilitator role. And my apologies, I didn't even invite you all to sh share in the chat box who you are and where you're from. Um, I really would invite you to do that now. Uh, thanks for letting me um, go through that. And some of the questions, uh, Chow is very kindly gonna support um, some note taking. Thank you, Chow. Um, but the main questions that I would like to uh, for us to talk about is what are some of the key implications for public health and personal action with these concepts in mind and who might be some unusual allies that we need to work with so and please if anybody has any questions on my presentation I welcome them now too Chow, feel free to um, pop up the notes if you'd like to share your screen now too. Stop sharing. Oh, sorry. Now I can see the chat. Oh. Hi, Jade. Hi. Is it okay if I start off? Please, I welcome it. Thank you. Hi, I'm Lori. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit. I, I know uh, your your title was um, housing. And you kind of went a little bit beyond that, but I wanted to go focus back in a bit on housing a bit. Yeah. Um, because I've been working with uh, the built environment for a long time. And uh, particularly one of the things I've been, I promoted like back in the mid nineties was the idea of vis visitable housing. And visitable housing is the notion that if you built homes that had a zero step entrance, to the house, wider doors, and a bathroom on the main floor that had wider doors, that more people would be able to get in and out of them, uh, no matter what their, um, their mobility issues are. And when you talk about chronic conditions, we know that a lot of people have mobility issues, but those kind of houses are actually better for everyone because you can push a baby carriage in and out, you can move your refrigerator into a house without tearing down the door frames. Um, but there's actually, this has been, was introduced back in the mid nineties. And if we're talking about healthier living, um, we need to, to be promoting this. As we have, yeah. a, as you said, a chronic, uh, more chronic conditions. We have older population, but it's better for even um, generations that are just raising babies now. So we, th this has been a big uh, fight, I would say, in North America to start getting more 
visitable housing in place. So I just wanted to throw that one out there for people. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Lori. And I'm sorry, yes, I know. I, it was kind of a high high level overview and didn't really dig into any of the specifics. So thank you so much for bringing that up. I think it is from thinking of that that perspective of housing, there is so much in, in, in that domain unto itself, specialized and supportive housing, adaptable housing so that it can be um, more equitably accessible to all in our community, you know, affordable, good quality, um, I think you brought up, brought up a really good point um, it too is, is, is when you said visible housing, I was almost thinking like, like eyes on the street too. Like there's a, um, in my conversations with planners, there often is a lot of discussion around bringing back the front porch and helping to support that, that um, return to almost a village model. Like well, completely. well, this is actually called visitable housing. Oh, visit and, thank you. And the idea is that everybody could actually visit everybody's home, mm. you see? So right now, if, if I can't do stairs, I'd never go and visit any of my family or friends, right? So if we want to actually promote um, the village, if we want to promote that we have a healthy house, um, and, and there are cities now that have mandated, like this is universal, it's not adaptable housing or anything like that, it's universal housing, and that every new home that's built has those three, just those three, a zero step entrance, a wider door, a bathroom on the main floor with a wider door, it's very simple. So they, there are cities now that it's mandated, right? Like every house that's new house that's built, it's built that way. So anyway, I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. No, I appreciate that. And thank you for clearing that up for me. Hi, Jade, it's Anne. Hi, Anne. Hi, I just want to thank you for that great uh, presentation. Very enthusiastic. I really, you know, can, can sense your, your passion. Um, I thought I'd just uh, start off with, the, you know, addressing a couple of the questions you mentioned in terms of key implement, uh, implications and personal action. I know I'm coming from this, uh, from a perspective of an interested citizen. Um, you know, I've been sort of removed from, from public health and health promotion for a while. So I was interested in this, um, you know, this topic because as a, as a citizen, I feel, um, you know, not, not empowered. I feel like the, you know, the local municipality and, and, you know, ha have made the decisions. Um, you know, I'm in a, I always say I'm stuck in suburbia. So I'm just outside in, of the greater Toronto area. So all you can see is sort of, you know, housing and sort of that whole, um, you know, the built environment being very driven by economics and, you know, mainly builders and, and local government. So, um, you know, looking forward to hearing your thoughts and anybody uh, in, in the work, uh, in the breakout group in terms of, you know, act, um, uh, small steps I can take for personal action. So that's one uh, question I had. Um, and then your, your point about unusual allies and, and you know, uh, who we can work with. Um, you know, I, I'm sort of in health IT. And so, you know, I was going to suggest in terms of, you know, uh, technology or folks in the startup industry or tech space innovation. I think, you know, with this pandemic, technology has played a, a critical role. And, um, you know, from a, that sort of uh, environmental ecological lens, I think uh, is some, you know, a field that, um, you know, public health could uh, build bridges to. So love to hear your thoughts. Thank you, Anne. I, I really welcome anybody else too to, to chime in as well. I know there's some phenomenal chat going on in the chat box, but um, may I say a couple of thoughts come to mind if I, if, if I may. Um, you know, I think it's getting involved in a lot of, of course, local governments, they're adhering to land use planning processes. So official community plan reviews, a master plan, whether it's related to active transportation, housing needs assessments, um, uh, parks and protected area plans. There are many. And of course, there are always requirements for public engagement. And so if as a as a citizen, you know, getting involved in those processes, providing some of that feedback, you know, singing the song of how and, and champion for the inclusion of health considerations in land use planning um, is immensely huge. It's, you know, of course, the power of the people. So um, I would encourage you to do that. Uh, and, um, and, um, yeah, I was wondering if anybody else had any um, comments to Anne's uh, brilliant points there. 
Yeah, can I pose a question? I did write this in the chat, but um, I'm a re retired from the P Public Health Center in in Ottawa, <clears throat> and um, now I live on Gabriola, so I see things very much from a local mm -hmm. perspective. And we have a health collaborative here, which everybody who's doing anything to do with health sits on, including people who are trying to set up available housing, etc. And so we we have this approach. So we might love to have you come over to Gabriola and talk about how this fits, because all the things to do with noise and pollution, air pollution, etc., are important factors for us on Gabriola. So I want to say thanks very much. But I have a question about um, the idea of the guaranteed annual income that is being talked about now. And in fact, since money is being distributed in this new way from governments, it, it does push more money into the community. And I'm wondering if there's any evidence that a guaranteed annual income actually changes housing in communities. Do you know about that? Hmm. You know, um, Donald, thank you for that. Um, I'd love to uh, <laughs> come and connect with you on, on, uh, on, it was Gabriola, you said, yes? Okay, great, thanks. Um, yeah, and I don't think I would be the best person in all honesty to speak of that, but um, I would, you know, talking about unusual allies, I think some economists uh, could be definitely uh, an unusual ally to really kind of speak to that best. Of course, we all need economic security. Um, you know, if you, you know, have a, a basic impact income um, that enables you to buy uh, local foods, have a roof over your head, all of these pieces, all of these aspects of our social determinants of health and being able to afford those assets um, are, are huge and key. So, um, but I would definitely encourage maybe someone from a kind of a more robust economic background to speak to that. Um, but it's, it's huge that that co-benefit piece in a lot of m my work is um, you know, the health argument is a nice, it's an easy sell. Um, but for those ones that maybe even struggle with that, um, talking about the dollars and cents is, is huge. That's kind of what seals the deal. So, um, and Anne, I'm sorry, there was one point that you didn't, that you mentioned, and I didn't address, it was about that IT aspect. And, and I, yeah, I couldn't agree more to that is an unusual and amazing ally. Um, here we are talking, talking about place and space. And I find, um, you know, as a, as a geographer in my background that way, like mapping GIS, um, bringing in that like data expertise um, is, is huge because it's, it's that graphic vis visualization. Um, Metro Vancouver has actually made a lot of traction in, in, in this regard, actually in partnership with that UBC study. I know there are many others, but the one that uh, I referenced in my slide deck where they're looking at just mapping out um, walkability, air pollution, Solution and as it relates to um, health outcomes in, in the population. So incredibly powerful um, tools for, um, for to, to take to policymakers and decision makers. Anyone else? I see that I'm like, I'm wanting to scan the chat because there's like so much rich conversation happening here. Um, Hey Jade, it's Jane Bennett here. Um, Hi Jane. Hi Mo, how are you? Good, how are you? Um, great presentation, thank you. You know, thank one you. of the things that this really brings to mind um, when I was working community development in downtown Nanaimo, and I, I really would love to see when we're talking about sustainable cities, um, built environment, there's an unbelievable lack of kindness in a lot of the development work that happens. You know, I, I remember one time working on a project trying to put a park, trying to put a bench on a street downtown and the unbelievable hoops that we had to jump through and, you know, it had to be septed, you know, no one could sleep on it. It couldn't, you know, and it just feels that it's, we have to move so far ahead. Um, I, I don't know if any of you remember just how much controversy there was putting a public washroom in downtown Nanaimo in Diana Crawl Plaza. Uh, uh, just, there has to be a change in people's mindsets and attitudes. I mean, when you talk about livable, walkable cities, uh, is something so simple as making a washroom available to people in our community causes uh, such a fuss that there's 
there's more work that has to be done rather than just identifying um, you know, some of the problems in the built environment. There's change in attitudes and mindsets. That just yeah. Oh, yeah, Jane, I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, yeah, thank you, Lori. Yeah, Lori, carry on. I just wanted to, I, I really agree with what you're saying, Jane. I really appreciate mm -hmm. your comments. And I was thinking as well, um, so I, I work both in Manitoba and in um, BC here on Vancouver Island. And back in Manitoba, I'm, I'm the head of an environmental group. And um, I think Man you know, Winnipeg is a lot far further behind, I, obviously, than um, BC. But I can tell you that um, talking about unfriendly, like the notion is so on economics, so that there's like there's this eight, you know the six acres of land that's now available that a private person is selling, and that we want to preserve that piece for more of a park space. But you can imagine the economic, you know, the developers are clamoring, and the city doesn't care because they can see that they're going to get their tax, um, you know, from that piece. And so how do you weigh that all out? How do we start really, um, like when we're thinking about all of these issues, um, convincing our cities that, that, that this is really important. And I know how we do it, we do it with numbers, we do it with it, et cetera, but it's not really happening. It's like everyone's, um, it, it, they're thinking about the, the mighty dollar rather than the health and all that. So anyway, I just throw that out. I'm frustrated right now because of my six acres that I don't, I want to see. <laughs> um, yeah. Jane and Lori, thank you. Those are brilliant, um, uh, you know, and very astute <laughs> observations. Yeah, NIMBYism is, is a very real problem and it's conveying that message, I think, to the, to the powers that be, I, I think maybe another un, unusual or unlikely ally in this discussion, and I'm not saying all would be receptive to this, but even the development community as a whole, um, you know, or, you know, in an isolated development, I have actually had some really great success with some very um, innovative and progressive uh, developers and, and kind of bringing that to straight to them. I think it, it is conveying that message. It's getting the message out. I think so many people don't think about those linkages that the built environment has and impacts their health. This is what COVID is, is doing to us. It's, 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 it's on our doorstep. It's in our backyard. It's in our homes. We're all, you know, af afraid of, of that potential. And, and I don't think these dots have been made uh, concretely clear at all because they're sometimes can be a little bit nebulous to connect. I've seen um, some really great success. Um, uh, so colleagues and counterparts, say for example, in the Lower Mainland, that um, again, um, where they have uh, come together. So public health has partnered up with local government. You know, medical health officers having those conversations, for example, with um, mayor and elected uh, officials. Um, you know, as, as folks like myself, um, public health nursing, community health networks, CAJ and I, Marcy, I see you're on there too. Um, you know, uh, just the, the folks that I, I know, kind of having those conversations more at the staff level and really it rallying the, the public and the community through educational campaigns, linking health and the built environment. Um, a phenomenal example out of Metro Band where they did just that, um, created like a fact sheet series about speaking up for health in certain um, policies and bringing, um, you know, again, the power, power to the people and illustrating and educating on these connections. I think you make a, it's, uh, it's Michael here. I think you make a really great point about um, the municipalities and, and getting other people at the table. Um, one way of engaging with developers, I mean, there are various mechanisms, but you mentioned that you've got experience in health impact assessment. Mm -hmm. That is a beautiful vehicle for getting different, um, different actors to the table and having a multi-sectoral conversation that explicitly brings health into the discussion. One great thing about, for example, HIA, but not necessarily HIA, having a multi-sectoral table though, is it's one way of ensuring that the community can be part of the conversation from the get-go. So if we're talking about sustainable, just, and healthy, the ways in which communities themselves and, represent, and representatives of neighborhoods can 
speak to issues in ways that people in other sectors will not understand or cannot bring to the table with the same authenticity, that's for sure. Um, HI is one vehicle for doing that, but municipalities are super important in terms of getting those multi voices at the table. So, thank you, thank you for that, Michael. Um, I couldn't agree more. It's, a, it's such a powerful vehicle. It's a systematic process that really um, brings the, those a variety of voices to the table and um, kind of it, it, much more strategic in its approach in um, not only highlighting some of the opportunities, um, you know, the, the challenge and some way to way to minimize uh, potential risk, but um, addressing uh, potential impacts. It's funny, I was uh, reading something just the other day on HIA and it was, um, it's like, it's like crossing the street, you know, um, it, HIA can be that tool that hel helps you to look both ways before you cross. Uh, and I thought that was a beautiful uh, analogy to the power of that tool and, and the, the power of bringing those voices to the table. Um, Quebec has had ep epic uh, um, success in this regard, um, as I understand, because it is HIA is embedded right in firmly into their public health act, something I think others have, are jealous of. But in the absence of such, there's so many great tools and so many, a plethora of examples to in, in, embed that process into, into land use planning. Yeah, so thank you so much for bringing that forward. I just wanted to expand on what Michael said, having been a person who has gone to the municipality um, in support or perhaps in opposition to the creation of some developments in my local community. So I live in View Royal, just outside of Victoria, and uh, have been privy to the beautiful or not so beautiful development that's happening out at Thetis Lake. And one of the things that was um, brought up consistently Obviously, economics is a huge um, factor in that. But this idea of creating sustainable or affordable um, or accessible, whatever the word is um, that you want to use, housing. And when I look at affordable housing from a public health lens, some of the things that I hope or I'm looking for is something to guide municipalities in making this decision. So if you don't know the, the Victoria area, Thetis Lake's kind of out in the middle of nowhere and what I mean by that is like it doesn't have access to grocery stores there's no transit out there it's really out um, kind of on its own and so this idea of creating affordable housing which was really the selling feature to from the developer to our municipality was kind of lost because it's not that affordable sure the price tag looks appealing but when you look at the fact that you have to own a car to be out there because accessing public transit or even getting groceries is near impossible there's no way you could walk to get your groceries how affordable is it really and i always question or wonder if there is a tool or something that can guide municipalities that members like myself, that citizens can come in and have a voice with a little bit more concrete evidence to say, hey, like, it's not that we don't want affordable housing. That has nothing to do with the question. It's just, we don't maybe think the place you've chosen is the best cho place for, the, for these reasons. Yes, uh, thank you for bringing up, I know the development well. Um, uh, there is uh, a make a make a plug for it, and I'm sure many on the on the line would be familiar with this tool. But the Healthy Built Environment Linkages Toolkit, um, it's uh, put out by uh, well, I guess now BC CDC. Um, but it's a great resource and it connects those dots between health and the built environment. It's um, produced by the Healthy Built Environment Alliance. Um, and so it's health professionals, uh, academics, um, as well as planners help to develop it. And it, it basically scoured the evidence and the literature and um, weighted the, the linkages between the built environment and health. So um, definitely encourage you to check out that toolkit. It's It does speak to affordable, accessible housing. It speaks to creating complete, com uh, compact and connected communities with that are um, mixed use neighborhood nodes that are connected, um, not continuing to sprawl um, for all the many health reasons. Um, you know, we know that longer commute times really uh, connect to um, increasing social isolation and community as well as well just continuing to um, you know put those greenhouse gases into our atmosphere and environment so uh, a really great resource I encourage you to check out um, the, 
Michael bringing up HIA, Metro Vancouver also did produce a health impact assessment guidebook and toolkit. Um, so one locally relevant to BC, where I am, but uh, a, a resource there. Um, also the National Collaborating Center for Healthy Public Policy has so many examples on HIA and examples where they've looked at master plan communities um, and, and spoken to the health impacts related to those, especially uh, as it connects to the transportation, uh, lack thereof or barriers too. So uh, a couple of really great sources of information. Any other thoughts from fo fo folks? And, um, you know, I'm curious too, if, if you guys are feeling like any, like dominant themes are really jumping out for you. Uh, we've, we've, got, we've got about 10 minutes left, but I uh, know we'll have to do the report back to the group or any other things that are bubbling up. And I'm just gonna have a peek through the, the chat box too, because. Jade, it's Marcy. Hi, Marcy. Hi, Jade. Um, just wanted to make a quick comment. I've seen a lot just like around um, age friendly plans and, and some, yeah. some of that other, some of those other planning processes. Um, and I think that one of the things that we're seeing locally, like with work with the health networks is we're always trying to embed some of these be best practices within the municipal plans. And so always trying to tie it back into health equity. Um, Jade, you're a great champion for that and such a help in our, in our health authority, um, reaching out to planners and municipalities um, to really link in um, those planning aspects into the OCPs and um, in different other community planning processes. Um, but just seeing that um, uh, those recommendations being embedded in these other, uh, I guess, parallel planning processes. So everything from child care action planning to age friendly planning, um, we're seeing all of that put in um, and really having those champions embedded within our system as well. So with the health networks, we're working with the municipalities, health authorities, um, and then have the benefit of having Jade in your position with the health authority. Uh, we have had, uh, who's just retired, um, a wonderful medical health officer who is a big champion in ensuring that municipalities knew who to reach out to um, and really championing um, their role in health. Uh, and I think that there's some really, all of those linkages just make such a big, such a big uh, impact on, on the work, the slow work <laughs> of integrating health equity into, into some of this planning. Well, thank you for that, Marcy. Um, by the way, I echo all of those sentiments right back at you. <laughs> uh, I couldn't do this work without the community health networks and the connections to them. You are a powerhouse and force to be reckoned with. So, um, you know, it, helping to connect those dots and bring community partners together to also champion for this same song that we're all singing. Um, I, I couldn't agree more. I think it's it's not just a, about the official community plan, which is kind of that bread and butter overarching document um, that really um, lays the foundation for land use development um, as it takes forward in communities, but it's all the other uh, uh, supportive uh, resources and master planning processes that are part of that. Age-friendly community planning is a big one um, that is seeming to get a lot of, uh, you know, for years, it's definitely getting a lot of, you know, funding support and um, and traction in communities. Really exciting to um, provide a vehicle to embed um, principles of equity into design and planning. But I couldn't agree more. It's another uh, discussion. So, you know, it, I, I urge you to um, stay, if you have the time or wherewithal to do so, is staying plugged in and connected as best you can to these processes within your communities. Um, you know, if, if you can get that health language embedded in, that health and all policies approach embedded into these land use plans, it actually can be a huge driver um, to, go, to go back to. So say you're seeing a development go forward that isn't embodying some of these principles, you can actually f feed these policies back to um, the decision makers to say, um, and I'm I don't want to paint the brush of all decision makers, but no means, but um, to feed them back to say, you know, we want to see these policies be adhered to, solidified, and um, in, included into said development, or maybe the development into itself needs to be thought to be elsewhere, so. I just wanted to make a comment. Um, I sit on a, a strata council, 
one of the issues with uh, sustainable, just, and healthy local housing is the um, lack of engagement of people in their stratas, for example. So there's a big problem with stratas in terms of having people who are willing to sit on their strata council. So it's really hard to bring forward policies, et cetera, if there's not engagement of people who have housing. Um, so that's one of the things that I'm seeing from um, that position. Um, and I think that that directly reflects, re relates to sustainable and just because uh, with the insurance stuff going up on um, stratas, it's almost becoming um, difficult for lower cost housing to be um, desirable. So there's several pieces there. Engagement of, of people who own stratas, um, the uh, effect of the um, insurance um, costs, and um, just recognition of those as um, big issues in terms of sustainable and just. Thank you. Oh, Maureen, thank you for that. I, I, I used to sit on my own strata council. And <laughs> I know it could be a challenge. It could be a real challenge to, to get people engaged. Um, you know, I think maybe those, we could add those to our list of some of those unusual, uh, you know, allies or, you know, is there a <coughs> mechanism to provide some of this information to um, strata, strata corporations or associations? Um, the insurance providers themselves. I mean, we were talking about some of those economic drivers. I thought that, that came up yesterday, actually, in the session that I intended is, is that could be, again, a powerful um, lever for, for change. Um, Just one other point yeah. is that um, for many stratas, there's a multicultural uh, and um, there's a multicultural factor with language as an issue. So, you know, it's all fine and dandy to do everything in English, but there's a lot of people who don't understand um, high, high level language in English. So that's another issue that stratas are facing. Yeah, thanks, Maureen. The brilliant points. I, I'm taking notes from all of you during this, so thank you. Um, uh, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more too about the engagement aspects and in engagement tools that will be accessible to 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 all. Um, you know, I think it's it's been a pretty uh, strong theme throughout the conference is also how do we get um, engagement from people that are tapped, maxed, you know, don't have the wherewithal. <laughs> the mechanisms, the desire, the, how, how do you meet people where they are to engage? Uh, it, it is not that I have an answer for this per se, but I, I would maybe encourage to try to uh, meet people where they are. And, um, you know, gosh, Marcy, I hope I, I, I'm going to share a quick story about you. I hope you don't mind, but I just always, um, always reflect back on, on some of the engagement tools that you've used uh, at the health network of like maybe, you know, s setting up at like the, the farmer's market. I'm probably totally not doing the story justice, but a way to be able to, um, again, people are, it's a captive audience uh, and you live in a beautiful community that has a very engaged and active farmer's market, as I understand that, uh, you know, it could be a, a tool to be able to, to really, uh, again, help that get that messaging out. And Marcy, I welcome you to stop me and, and say the story better than I. Sorry to put you oh, on the spot. But. Sorry, sorry to interrupt, but we have uh, one minute and oh, 20 seconds left. We no. need to come up with like three or five key points. And then uh, we need one volunteer to present them, if anyone is willing. <laughs> Thanks, Chow, keeping me on track. Would anybody be willing to present us back or speak to uh, a couple of things that they, they'd like uh, us to report back on? I think we could just put the points that you took the notes on, Chow, especially the toolkits um, and the who we think the unlikely partners might be. Um, and sure. then the idea of the, the need to look beyond economics when it comes to development. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and would you be willing to volunteer to present to the group, I guess? If nobody else is feeling inclined, I suppose I could do that. Um, but if somebody else is feeling inclined, I welcome them stepping in. 
I'm sure you do a brilliant job. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to do it as well, but uh, always okay. nice to hear from other voices. I did one yesterday, so I think you should go for it because I think your energy for this topic um, is, is what um, people need to hear because I think it's really invigorating. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. It was so Thanks. nice to meet you. Chow, you might also be able to add municipalities to the unlikely, uh, like citizens, municipality citizens to the unlikely allies, because we had spoken about that quite a bit. Yeah. And I think Jade will just be able to run with this and go for it. I think she's got a lot to, to chat about. Thank you so much for taking the notes. Yeah, no problem. I'll see you back in the main session. Mm-hmm.